in order to understand um, the contemporary art world, I think it's probably really important to understand the movement called pop art and how pop art relates to earlier periods. So pop art is mainly a movement that happened during the 19, late 1950s and into the 1960s, and in some ways is confined to the New York area, uh, especially Manhattan. A couple of the, the major players that you may recall, Andy Warhol, there's a whole music scene surrounding it. And it's gonna be really hard to cover everything in a really short lecture. So we're just gonna cover a couple of um, iconic or important artists who are from that time period. And the first one we're gonna cover is Robert Rauschenberg. And Robert Rauschenberg is a pop artist and primarily the sort of medium or style of art that he worked with was something he called combines. Combines take the idea that um, Marcel Duchamp came up with of the ready-made found object and reconfiguring or recombining those objects to make something that was a work of art. So if you look at this piece called Canyon, when you look through most of your art history survey books, they really won't have any great interpretation of what this combine or mixed media painting really means. It's basically just a big canvas, about six feet by five feet. It has all kinds of things that Rauschenberg found in the trash. And what I want to uh, emphasize is, if you go to graduate school or art school now, this is probably pretty standard practice. We used to call it dumpster diving art, where you would go and you would <clears throat> go out on trash days and find things that you thought were interesting or cool. You'd bring it back into your studio and you'd put these things together and you would make a work of art and that the artist uh, was sort of recombining or recontextualizing pieces of trash or, or found ephemera, stuff like that, and making a deeper meaning. Now, in, for instance, Stockstad, this, the textbook that I use for my classes, I love this quote because it, it sort of lets uh, you off the hook a little bit. It basically says that um, uh, Rauschenberg's work, <laughs> let me see if I can find the quote in the textbook, I'll read it to you. Um, Rauschenberg made a series of objects that he entitles combines, combinations of painting and sculpture using non-traditional art materials. In one of these, Canyon, which is the one we're looking at right here, Rauschenberg brings together a roughly painted canvas with a stuffed eagle emerging from a box, a dirty pillow tied with a cord suspended from a piece of wood, and a flattened steel drum. On the canvas itself, Rauschenberg glued family photographs, images cut from newspaper and magazines, and fragments of political posters. Canyon is so dense with cultural references that it is impossible to find a single unified meaning in the piece. In fact, Rauschenberg believed that viewers should find their own meaning in his art as if searching for metaphors for the experience of modern urban life. He said, a quote, I only consider myself successful when I do something that resembles the lack of order that I sense. All right, so here's the deal. In my mind, what this work really is, is a sort of thematic apperception test or one of those Rorschach ink blots that the person who is looking at this work of art would come and take a look at it and try to figure out what it means. And you can actually figure out more about the person and their interpretation of the work of art uh, by asking them what, what they think it means than actually what Rauschenberg's intention was. So it's using the earlier psychological theory that we had discussed using Freud and Jungian sort of archetypes that uh, Duchamp was tapping into. And, and what I'm suggesting is basically, when you put one image next to another image, people's minds just want to create a meaning out of that. Even when you look at a refrigerator and you see all of the pictures on someone's refrigerator with all the magnets, you'll create an image of who that person is just by looking at their refrigerator and what kinds of things are put on that refrigerator. So think of this painting in a way as almost a refrigerator door that an artist made where they just collected scraps of things that they thought were cool and were trying to create a deeper meaning from it. And I think that's probably the safest thing to think about. Now, one of the things about pop art from this time period and what makes it so-called pop art and makes Rauschenberg and his roommate Jasper Johns pop artists is that they're taking pop icons, popular items from 
basically the stream of culture and recombining them or reconfiguring them to make deeper meanings. In this way, <laughs> even though they call themselves pop artists, they're not very different from the surrealists that we studied much earlier. So for instance, Max Ernst, we looked at this piece when we were studying surrealism. It's, uh, it's, it's sort of a combine, if you think about it. It's stuff that Max Ernst found he puts it back together again. He applies a kind of fancy title to it. In this case, two children are threatened by a nightingale, which is very suggestive. It's almost like a piece of poetry. And then you make up a meaning for that. And you think, oh, wow, well, that's kind of deep. I got I to gotta figure out what that means. And so what they're doing is using almost the way some poets do that, uh, where you <clears throat> offer up some imagery, you offer up a couple of um, incomplete phrases and you expect the viewer or the reader to make up a new meaning as they're looking at it and they might the artist is completely aware that they no longer have control over the spin or the meaning of what's going on with these images and they kind of dig that and I think that's in a way almost democratic in how they're dealing with the art that they're offering it up as something that you can play with rather than something that is preaching to you Rauschenberg and uh, Jasper Johns were roommates, and I think that they were actually lovers in New York during the 1950s, and that's going to be something that's going to be important uh, about 1950s and 1960s culture, and also in understanding their art, because in some ways I think that they fed off of each other. So Jasper Johns is making what's called a field painting here. <laughs> it's a it's a combine, but I don't think he called his work combines. I think Rauschenberg, his roommate, basically, you know, sort of cornered the market on that term. But he is doing the same thing, and they're both sticking with what uh, earlier surrealists Duchamp and Hannah Hoch and some of these other people did, where they again, it's the taking things from the sort of popular culture stream or the trash stream, if you will, and recombining them to make a meaning. So in this instance, if you look at this painting, it actually has cans of paint, um, some uh, other kinds of objects glued to it, stencils, letters. And if you look closely at the stencils and the letters of these two um, paintings that are sort of these two canvases that were placed together, you'll see that it has red, yellow, and blue written in the, um, in the stencil in the paint. And he calls it a field painting because almost every period of art in art history sort of relies on the fact that they're thumbing their nose or changing the schema of the earlier period. So this is a field painting, which is like Mark Rothko's color field paintings. So Mark Rothko and some of the earlier painters from just before this time period worked mainly with with formal concerns and so what i'm talking about is they they're working with texture they were working with pure fields of color sort of like kazimir malevich uh and and uh vasily kandinsky and other painters from the time period before were working with actually more formal concerns they were um you know if you recall the terms supremacist painting uh which the idea was to boil things down make an abstract form that expressed pure ideas and and uh expressed sort of a pure emotion and was a pure aesthetic in this case <laughs> jasper johns is kind of making fun of that by saying it's a color field painting because i'm providing you with the words now again this goes back to something that we talked about in the Surrealist lecture when we were talking about the idea of cognitive dissonance. And I think you can't underestimate how important that phrase is, even if artists didn't really quite understand it when they used it, is to modern art. Cognitive dissonance is the idea of holding two opposing thoughts in your mind at the same time. So kind of saying uh, something to the effect of, this is a color field painting, but also knowing that it's not a color field painting at the same time. So it's kind of like having a switch on and off at the same time and realizing critically that you can look at this painting from both sides, that it's kind of a reference to that, but it's not really the same thing. I also think that pop art tends to be a little snarky 
and a little bit mean in some ways about American culture under the guise of expressing some political and, uh, and sort of points of view of the artist. So for instance, in the last painting, the color field painting, I think that Jasper Johns was kind of making fun of color field painting. In this instance, in a way, I don't want you to get the idea he was he was unpatriotic necessarily, but what I'm saying is he was kind of thumbing his nose at an icon. And so remember when we first started studying in this class, iconography is the study of the symbols or the content of the painting. Icons are desktops. On, uh, on your desktop, you have icons that open up a program that, that stand for the program. An American flag is an icon of America, right? So in this instance, we have a painting that's an icon of America, but it's done with a type of wax paint called encaustic. And encaustic is a kind of, um, it's beeswax that you melt down and you add pigments to. And so he painted the stars and stripes here with this sort of wax painting, but underneath it, almost kind of like a time capsule, he places newspaper, a uh, newspaper from the time period, from the 1950s. And so what we have is a canvas that he's coated with newspapers. It's almost like a collage, again, uh, that we saw with Hannah Hawk and we saw with uh, Marcel Duchamp and some ar other artists earlier. And then he paints an American flag on top of it. And so in a way, it's a time capsule that is covered by an American flag, almost like um, a coffin uh, with a soldier in it, in a way. Uh, we have this idea of preserving in the layers of the paint stories that have to do with America. And so he's embedding American culture within an American flag. Now, some people, if you, uh, if you study politics and you study American history a little bit more, this was also the era uh, just before Abby Hoffman. And people are really attached to, to cultural icons, especially patriotic symbols like the American flag. And to do something like this was very provocative. It was a way of pushing people's buttons. And so you have to think what artists are trying to do, uh, especially Jasper Johns and Rauschenberg, is push the limits in a way, push the envelope of meaning and push what people can take and what people are willing to sort of grapple with. And in some ways, the ideas are much more important than the actual physical object of the art. And that's something that I think is really dominant in art and art history. Probably after the Surrealist period, I think that the ideas behind the making of a work of art are more dominant, they're more important than actually the end result, which is a sort of artifact of this, the artist's thought process. And I know that sounds like art speak, but basically what I'm kind of saying is beauty, uh, prettiness, uh, something that would be appealing uh, on a sort of physical or visceral level becomes uh, sort of secondary to creating a statement and making, uh, making people think in a way as a form of art. Jasper Johns did a series of sort of combine or, or collage-like works of art that are assemblages. And assemblage is just a French word and it looks like the term assemblage. So an assemblage or assemblage <laughs> is basically taking stuff and recombining it and putting it together, assembling it and making a meaning out of it. So again, this thing, I, it's actually something I would love to be able to play with because you have these plaster faces that are in this sort of closet that are on top of this canvas. And that It's actually hinged and looks like it could be pulled down and you could put these faces back in the closet. Now there's also a target. And again, we have newspapers and uh, and plaster and uh, encaustic placed over the newspaper. Uh, and so again, it, it's a sort of time capsule. And then we have another symbol or icon, which is a target, which we all kind of get. Now, I'm not sure ha if I have this right, and you might have teachers who disagree, or you could even disagree with the interpretation of this because he didn't publish what, he, what you know we're supposed to think about this. but. My feeling about this, my interpretation of it, is that because Jasper Johns and Robert Rauschenberg were two gay men who were living together, maybe they felt like targets and that they were in the closet. 
maybe this is just too literal of a, of a reading for this sort of assemblage, uh, but I think that might be a reasonable interpretation of this work of art, that even though the artist, like Rauschenberg was saying with his piece Canyon, that you need to sort of come up with your own meaning behind this, I think that on some kind of subconscious level, they knew that by combining certain things together that people would kind of get their drift or get their meaning a little bit. Richard Hamilton is another pop artist. He happens to be from England, and so we're going to call it English pop art. Uh, he's, he, but he is closely allied or aligned to the New York School of Pop Artists. And he does a small collage. It's 10 inches by 9 inches. So, you know, you have to think Hannah Hawke's collage that we're going to look at in a minute and Richard Hamilton's collages both sort of tie in with that time period. And so when you're making collages like you did in grade school, it has to be a fairly small scale because you're cutting these things out of magazines and out of popular culture. And what he's doing in this painting or this collage, <laughs> sorry, that it's called Just What Is It That Makes Today's Home So Different, So Appealing, he's kind of doing what the Surrealists did by providing this sort of long title that is very suggestive. Immediately, he's giving a sort of meaning to this that, oh, it's about today's homes and they're appealing. So then you look at this thing and there are all these sort of silly uh, almost, it's it's kind of like a joke, like a Monty Python, you know, animated thing, where you have all of these things that are typical icons of modern culture. Uh, and I like to suggest, even though he's English, that it's modern American culture in a way, because we have this romance magazine in the window behind, uh, in in the background there. There's a uh, a reference to a very popular movie uh, with Al Jolson in it called The Jazz Singer, which is this <laughs> basically a Jewish guy playing uh, a uh, an African guy in blackface. So that's sort of a shameful past in, in the United States and still kind of going on at that point in time because civil rights hasn't taken hold. Then we have in the background, there's this woman on the steps who's vacuuming, and there's an arrow that points to the cord uh, or the tube on the vacuum that says, ordinary cleaners reach only this far. So it's kind of like an advertisement. As you move across the, the picture itself, you see all these sort of like things that are icons of American culture, like technological marvels from the 1950s that everybody would want to own. Sort of the CD player of the time was that reel-to-reel -reel tape deck in the foreground, televisions in the background, uh, posters with romance magazine, and then on the wall in the very background you have this thing that looks kind of like an ancestor, and that might be a reference to that. The ceiling has the moon in it, which might be referencing the uh, the space race, and then <laughs> the two main figures, I, I know you were waiting for me to get to them. <laughs> this guy with the with the pop, the uh, the blow pop, uh, is, a, is a bodybuilder. And I think that the reference is pretty obvious there, you know. And the woman with the lampshade, who's sort of a burlesque queen, who uh, has a, a lampshade, which is kind of one of those jokes about people getting drunk at parties, putting lampshades on their heads and looking ridiculous. I think... All of this adds up like almost like a math equation. You take all these symbols and you put them together and you say, oh, the American consumer is an idiot because they value these things and they're kind of cheesy and they're kind of ridiculous in how we value these things and they have no real value in a, in a way. They're all just sort of gimmicks and toys and we look ridiculous. Maybe that's what this thing means. Certainly, it relates again to surrealism and it relates to Hannah Hoch. Um, Hannah Hoch is this Dada artist from the early 1900s, right? We talked about her earlier. And she is making a collage that in some ways is very similar to Richard Hamilton's. And when we studied this Dada um, collage before, one of the things that I suggested in my earlier lecture is that <laughs> The collage form for Hannah Hoch was this idea of the fragmentation of society as modernism is starting to happen, as industrialization is starting to happen. So you have all of these fragmented sort of random images that are thrown together and sort of make a statement 
about how things are at that time period. There's a reference to Einstein. There are machines. There are people who are dancing and playing. And then throughout it is the one word that means nothing. <laughs> uh, if you look in your textbook, they say, well, Dada means a kid's child hobby horse or a rocking horse or something like that. But basically, Dada, if you read the manifesto, they literally say Dada means nothing. And so what I think that they're doing is they're playing with nonsense, almost like a Lewis Carroll kind of playing with, um, with nonsensical imagery and placing all these things together in a way to make fun of the culture that we are participating in at each time period. And so both of these artists, if you think about it, are making a statement or critiquing or criticizing even the culture that they are living in at that point in time. Of course, you've heard of Andy Warhol and uh, he is an interesting character. And again, he exists at this time period and he is most popular in the decade of the 60s. That's when he really gets going. And I guess his biography is kind of important. Um, he, he was actually uh, from the Midwest and studied commercial art there. And then he moves to New York and he's doing commercial art. And some of the ideas behind his work seem to be taking commercial art imagery that has to do with his training and then incorporating them into so-called high art or fine art. So we have to explore an idea about high and low art before we can move on with these lectures. And it really almost retroactively applies to some of the works that we just looked at. There's a guy named Walter Benjamin who wrote an article that's called Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. It's this uh, sort of seminal or really important article that a lot of um, advanced art history students have to read. It's Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction by Walter Benjamin. And the thesis for the article, the main idea is more or less this, that as things become more and more reproduced through mechanical reproduction, for instance, printmaking and that kind of stuff, it becomes less valuable. So commercial art, and pop art that's in magazines and, and labels for cans and things like that, even though they're very well designed and they could be extremely beautiful, they're considered low art because they're not one of a kind. They're not handcrafted. And we even have this, uh, this sort of penchant for handcrafting things. Even in some beer commercials, they talk about a handcrafted beer. You know, it's kind of ridiculous. Why would a, something handcrafted necessarily taste better than something that was made by a machine. It's just a matter of subjective preference. So what Andy Warhol was doing is he's taking something that he considered to be kind of beautiful, this label. And if you watch him in videos and stuff, he's this sort of sarcastic, understated guy who wears a white fright wig. And he, he, he had a persona that was deliberately kind of bizarre. And he would say, well, I have Campbell's soup every day for lunch. Um, and I just thought that the label was interesting. But I think in some ways it's very thoughtful that he is taking something that is actually kind of a beautiful design. He's reproducing it with silkscreen, which is a sort of fine art medium that allows for errors and mistakes to happen. It's not necessarily a mechanical completely automated kind of process, and he does it on a canvas. The Brillo boxes on the left-hand side are the same kind of thing. He takes wooden boxes and he paints them <laughs> with silk screen to make them look like, uh, like factory manufactured cardboard boxes, and he installs these things in galleries. And so the Brillo boxes and the Campbell soup cans that Andy Warhol is so famous for probably are a way of saying, do a second take, do a second look at these kinds of things and let me know if you think that this is as attractive as I think it is. Now, of course, Brillo boxes and Campbell's soup are sort of icons of American consumer culture because they're the kinds of things that we like and we buy and, and we recognize these things immediately. So when you put them in an art gallery, it recontextualizes them, sort of like what Duchamp did with that urinal that we studied earlier. 
And by repeating these things on big canvases and simulating, um, you are sort of by hand reproducing something that's manufactured automatically in a factory. I had a teacher named Tony Lee when I was studying about 20 years ago at the University of California, Davis, and he loved to use these two words, simulation, simulacra, simulacrum. And the idea that he came up with is that the soup cans and a lot of pop art are simulacra of real objects that were made by machine. And when you simulate the making of these things by hand, what you're doing is you're shifting them from so-called low code culture, which means, you know, sort of everyday low things that are cheap to high culture because you're hand making them. I think there's also an idea in that, for instance, in taking an icon and almost like stamps on a, on a sheet of stamps, reproducing that icon over and over again, but doing it by hand with all kinds of errors in it, that you're kind of calling attention to what that icon means and what it looks like. There might be a deeper meaning behind this as well. Um, I guess I have to give you some, some context first. Andy Warhol ran this sort of warehouse in Soho, which is the sort of warehouse district of, of New York, in which he had a whole bunch of uh, his friends and, and other artists would hang out there and they'd, they'd lay around and, and do some drugs and get high and, and drink and whatever and, and make art together. And in his factory, what he would do is he would provide the materials and silkscreen and he'd ask people to make big canvases using a concept that he'd come up with. And in this case, it's a, a portrait of Marilyn Monroe. And when there were mistakes and errors in how these things were printed out, it actually just made it look more handmade and would make it seem more like fine art or high art. So again, it's a shift from low art to high art, even though you're using a semi-automated process to make it. Then the icon itself of Marilyn Monroe might relate to Andy Warhol and his um, sexual orientation. Uh, it's, it's pretty clear he was a gay man um, and I think what Warhol is kind of doing is saying, is this really as beautiful and feminine as you think it is? Or is she kind of almost like, uh, sort of like the clown from, from the movie It or from the novel It by uh, Stephen King? It's, it's, she becomes almost creepy in the reproduction and how many times he reproduces her face can be extremely creepy, and she looks more like a mask than she looks like an icon of female sexuality in how she is reproduced in these silk screens over and over again. Now, I think that this also, this icon of the blonde woman with the with the sort of quaffed eyebrows and the mascara and the, and the thick lipstick is, uh, is sort of a caricature of feminine beauty that we can also see in the works of low art that are comic book art. And there was one artist who I think is really aware of this. His name is Roy Lichtenstein. I've also heard it pronounced Lichtenstein, so you can go whatever way you want. Um, and Lichtenstein was this artist who took comic book art and he would repaint even these sort of dots, the halftone screens. If you look very closely at a magazine or an old comic book, you can see little dots that kind of make up the color. Those are called Benday dots. And he would repaint these things on a monumental scale on very large canvases. And so in a way he is reframing how a single page out of a comic book could look. And also the images he chose to represent or to depict or redepict, I guess you'd say, it are really iconic, meaning that they're very symbolic of what we think. And remember when we looked at the Richard Hamilton, there was that romance magazine that was on the back wall. This probably has a similar kind of feeling to it. And she looks a little bit like Marilyn Monroe, the thick lips, the, the sort of uh, overdone mascara, the, the garishly blonde hair. And so what Lichtenstein and some of these other artists are doing is sort of calling attention to 
symbols or icons, and they're making us critically aware of how we see these things. We also consume, and um, this might be a, a good time to introduce that idea, consumer culture and commodification are probably two terms that will come up if you're taking this in another art history class. Commodification is basically a commodity, right? So anything that you can sell and resell is a commodity. And so a lot of the artists during the 60s and 70s, remember this is during the, the sort of counterculture movement of the 1960s with the hippies and that kind of thing and the back to nature movement, people were very upset with how the 1950s had impacted America and how much we were into buying and selling stuff and into consumer culture. The same thing happened in the 80s. And I guess you could say it's still happening today. So what these guys are kind of doing is they are kind of critiquing consumer culture and commodification and even the kinds of things we consume, which are how we're being brainwashed about stereotypes of male and female beauty. Now, I think an interesting other idea, <laughs> which uh, I really kind of dig, is that um, Lichtenstein was co-opting and, and sort of stealing, you know, it was, it's clearly it's copyright infringement, and yet he made himself famous doing it. He would steal images out of popular culture. So one person on their website here, this Dave, uh, David Barcelo, um, he basically collected some of the images that Lichtenstein used originally, and then he paired them up with Lichtenstein's paintings. And I think it's just kind of interesting to see how Lichtenstein sort of chose to actually caricature an already caricature of something. I think actually these guys probably drew better than he did. So let's study some sculpture. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's like the history of the toilet here. Remember Marcel Duchamp. I guess we should look at him first and then we can we can go to, to looking at these two things. Marcel Duchamp took a urinal in the early 1900s and he takes it off the wall, puts it in an art gallery and says and calls it the fountain. And then he adds a little sarcastic statements signing it our mud and stuff like that reference to Mutton Jeff and things like that. Um, and he is making you see this urinal in a different way. I don't know if you really see it in a different way because it's still clearly a men's urinal. But he calls it the fountain and he recontextualizes it. He calls it a ready-made and he's taking it. Well, that's the history of art history from the 1900s. This artist, Klaus Oldenburg, did something kind of similar. What Klaus Oldenburg did was he actually would take the image of the toilet and he would remake toilets, but in something called Kapok, which is just basically a, a nylon um, and, a, and a vinyl. And he would, he would put these, he'd made soft, soft sculptured toilets, kind of like a stuffed animal, but it's a toilet. And um, what he's doing is he's taking something that's manufactured by machine in a factory He's hand manufacturing it so that it's useless, literally useless, except for as a work of art. And he's calling your attention to how it looks. But he's also referring to art history. And again, it's that schema and correction idea that I was telling you about, where he's referencing a past schema and he's bringing it forward. And he liked to do this. And it's very similar throughout all these, these, um, these artists that they take art history and they sort of change your view of art history. They say, I went to art school, I understand the whole tradition, and I'm gonna change that. Now, in the pop art movement, not only are they saying that they understand art history, they even understand um, the Bauhaus. And one of the movements that, that we've studied is Bauhaus, which was the idea that they said, let's throw out antique art history and antique design and come up with new industrial design where form follows function. And so if you think about it, in the 1960s, the Bauhaus aesthetic of even designing things like clothes pins is almost monumental for artists who are growing up in the 50s and 60s. And so I think what Klaus Oldenburg does by making these large useless objects that are of everyday objects is kind of calling attention to the history of design and not just the history of art history. <laughs> 